Well, good morning and welcome to Sierra Bible Church. My name is Carl. For those of you who don't know me, I am one of the pastors uh, here. If you haven't already, if because of the scripture reading, or if you haven't already because of the creative video that was displayed, please turn with me to Psalm chapter 63. We're going to be working through the entire psalm this morning on this journey that we have been on through the book of Psalms. Uh, that's Psalm 63. Uh, as you're turning there, let me tell you a little story. I, I grew up in a very small church. It was one of those churches where everybody knew everybody. Everybody's deeply involved in one another's life. On an Easter Sunday, if everybody showed up and a couple of people, a lot of town friends were there, maybe we would have something around the, the lines of 80 people in our church. Uh, we did not have uh, projection, projection screens. We, we, we didn't have a, a, sound, a, a, a ampl- sound amplification. We, we didn't even have um, extremely experienced uh, musicians at our church. But every now and then, when the worship leader would begin singing, Oh God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. My body longs for you. My soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And it would pause for a moment. I have seen you in the sanctuary, beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. And I, I will praise you. For as long as I live, and in your name, Lord, I lift my hands to worship you and adore you. This moment came over the congregation in which God met with us. It was as if he would by his spirit, come down from heaven and just give the entire congregation just this large hug and there wouldn't be a dry eye in the congregation. There wouldn't be a set of hands that was not raised in the air towards God and there would not be a deep sense of conviction that our God is with us and that he loves us. It didn't have to do anything with the the worship leader. It didn't have anything to do with the acoustics. It didn't have anything to do with the external things. It had to do with our hearts were coming before God, singing his praises, and God, by his grace and by his mercy, met with us in those moments and gave us the song. You probably haven't heard that melody that I just sung to you because the worship leader just took the words of Psalm 63 and put music to it, and it became our song. It was a gift from God to us in that small little congregation that God met with us in the midst of that song to let us know, I love you and I'm with you. So what I want to talk about this afternoon or this morning uh, in light of Psalm 63 is the very fact that, that God delights when we earnestly seek him. When our soul is thirsty for more of God, God delights in opening up the floodgates of his presence and his love and his mercy to satisfy our aching soul. We are going to see two ways in which God satisfies, God meets and responds to the thirsty soul that is hungry for more of him. So before we move any further, let me just start with the question of, does your soul long for more of God? Do you desire in the the depths of your being for more of God's presence in your life? If so, you're in the right place. You have come to the gathering of God's people that hopefully by God's call and by God's spirit that we are gathered together hungry for more of him. 
not simply to check off a religious routine and not, not simply to go through the motions of what we think is right for us to do, but because we long to come before God in his presence, where we long to gather with other believers and exalt his name so that he might, by his spirit, satisfy our soul. This was David's experience as he was penning Psalm 63, and I'm praying that we resonate deeply with his hunger and his ache, and it becomes our hunger and our ache for more of God in our lives. So as we mentioned last week, uh, the, the superscription of the book of Psalms gives us some details into what is happening behind the scenes in a particular psalm. Much like the, the hymn writer, Horatio Spafford, as he penned the lyrics of It Is Well With My Soul, it's a beautiful hymn, but if you know the background to when he penned that, he, he penned that on a boat, he came up with the lyrics on a boat as he is traveling from the, the United States to England, and as he's going over the, the very part of the Atlantic Ocean where all four of his daughters passed away the words come to life don't they when you hear when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul just like knowing Horatio Spafford's background can help us know the deep, the depth and the meaning of that particular hymn, so also knowing the background to the Psalms helps us appreciate the depth and the meaning of the psalmist. And we get this in Psalm 63 in the superscription. It says, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. This is the same time period that we saw last week in Psalm 3 when David is running, he's fleeing away from his son Absalom when Absalom wants to usurp the throne from David. Rather than start a civil war, David flees from Jerusalem and he wanders in the wilderness as Absalom is trying to get the troops of Israel to turn on their king David. And they are longing and they... And, and, Absalom is longing to kill David and take the throne of David. So David, in this particular psalm, he's isolated. David is not coming before the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. David is not seeing the sacrifices being made unto God, unto Yahweh. He's not gathering in the congregation to hear the songs being lifted up to Yahweh, their God. He's not in the fellowship of the people of God continually and regularly. He's out in the wilderness and he's being socially isolated. He's socially distancing himself from the rest of the people of God, and it creates this deep longing within his soul that he pens this, this first verse of this psalm of lament. Now, this psalm of lament is not lamenting the pain that his enemies are causing him, this psalm of lament is the ache in his soul of what he is experiencing because he's not able to gather with the people of God in the temple. This ache is coming and is given birth during his experience in the wilderness because he's not allowed, he's not permitted to go through the, the normal routine of worship and praise of God that he has continued to fill his soul with. So he says this, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. He's isolated and alone in the wilderness. And he's saying, even in my isolation, God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. He's experiencing what he is feeling in this isolating is this isolated incident away from the people of God and he's he's noticing that his soul is is not satisfied in God right now because he's apart from the people of God he's not in the presence of God in the temple 
My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. And then he looks across the landscape as where he's hiding from Absalom and notices this is a desert wasteland here. And he notices this desert wasteland that's dry and weary, that is an accurate description of my own soul right now. As in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. God, as I look around at the landscape and I see that there is no bubbling brooks, there's no rivers that are, that are quenching thirst, that, oh God, is how my soul feels right now apart from you. That is, is how I feel when I am distant away from the people in the gathering in the temple to exalt you properly and behold your presence. He's lamenting before the Lord, crying out, saying, God, I earnestly seek you, but I'm so unsatisfied right now. I long to be filled, but yet I am in this season that is dry and weary. But the ache doesn't come because he doesn't know God. The ache doesn't come because he doesn't have a relationship with God. The ache within his soul comes because he knows what he's missing out on. He knows what it's like to be in the full presence of God to experience him fully in his temple, in his sanctuary, tabernacle, I should say. He knows what it's like to be in the gathering of God's people, to behold God's power and to see God's glory, and that that experience in and of itself cannot be compared to with anything in life. And that's what he pens in the next verse, verse 2. Remembering, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. I remember the worship in the tabernacle. I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. And it's in those moments where he remembers what it's like to have to be the, the king of Israel, working alongside of the high priest in Israel, to have the high priest represent the people of God in Israel, to offer the one sacrifice to cleanse the the nation of Israel from sin from that entire year to, for the, uh, the high priest to enter into the most holy place and offer the, uh, make the offering unto God into the place only the high priest could go. And the sense of anticipation within David and the entire nation of Israel as Aaron is, or, or Aaron's descendants are heading into the most holy place and the sense of anticipation of, is God going to receive our sacrifice? Or is God going to kill the high priest and are we going to dra have to drag out his dead body? The sense of, of fear and trepidation as the, the high priest would enter into the most holy place and the entire nation was on the, the edge of their seats or the tip of their toes because they probably really weren't sitting down just longing for God to respond to them in love and mercy as the high priest put the blood on the mercy seat. And David is recalling these experiences in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, and then he remembers verse 3. That feeling of knowing that their sins have been forgiven. That experience within their soul that my, my sin is, is cleansed, I'm absolved. Verse 3, because your steadfast love is better than life. That moment of the high priest coming out from the most holy place. God has received the sacrifice. He has cleansed the nation from sin. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you, David says, as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. He's recalling all of these things in the sanctuary. And he's earnestly seeking this experience with God yet again in the midst of his dry and weary season in his own soul. But what sustains him presently, if he can remember back upon the good times in the sanctuary, but he's in the middle of the wilderness where he's not able to approach God in the temple, what sustains him moving forward in present? He remembers how good God has been in verses 5 and 6, and he knows 
In the future, God will continue to be good to him. Verse 5, my soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food. You ever have that experience where you're just physically exhausted? You've expended your energy all day, giving yourself over to yard work or being outside doing things with your kids or your grandkids, and you are just famished and exhausted. And then you head inside, and there prepared for you is this decadent, huge feast. And the hunger within your body is satisfied with rich, meaty food. Anybody have that experience, how, how satisfying that is? David is saying, that experience, that hunger in my soul is going to be satisfied in the future because God is good in verse 5, and my mouth will praise you. As he's alone and isolated in verses 6 and 7 and 8, he remembers God's sustaining power even though he is cut off from the congregation at this point. Verse 6, When I remember you upon my bed, and I meditate upon you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. God sustains David even through the dry season of the wilderness and lets him know one day God will satisfy every longing within his thirsty soul. We had this dog growing up, and he was a great dog to the rest of my family, but he wasn't the greatest dog to me in particular. That's a whole nother sermon illustration for a different time. But this particular dog did not like his own food, the food that would make him healthy, the food that would make him uh, spry and uh, agile and the, the dog that he should have been, he loved eating table scraps. And boy, was he good at giving you the puppy dog face. Anything that fell to the ground, he would just mop up. And he would beg us as kids, hey, just throw me that pack of Cheetos. Just throw me down some of those Whoppers or everlasting gobstoppers. And he would feast on table scraps. And he was also a dog that didn't necessarily like to exercise. So he ate unhealthily and he didn't like to exercise. So you could imagine the uh, physical fitness of this uh, little small dog. He was very stout, to put it nicely, and couldn't run very fast. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I fear... I fear that the church has settled for table scraps. I, I fear that, that we have been given this wonderful gift of the scriptures, of given this wonderful gift of being able to gather in the name of Jesus to feast spiritually as we come together before God and we settle for such less substitutes. We settle for the table scraps of spiritual experiences and think, oh, we're doing okay. When in reality, God is calling us to feast on a well-balanced spiritual meal so that we can expend our energy in radical service to God and to God's kingdom, and yet we're just so easily satisfied with things that are causing us to be spiritually out of shape. You know, saying, Carl, what, what are you talking about in particular? I'm talking about our hunger for politics. I'm talking about our, our hunger to have our candidate win and their candidate lose. I'm talking about the, the spiritual energy that we should be using to love our neighbor and serve his church being expended 
in arguing with people online with all caps and thinking, I'm doing my Christian duty in Christian service. I'm talking about the the, the passion and zeal that we should have to see the lost come to know Jesus and serve them in Jesus' name. And instead, get stirred up about whatever is happening culturally and use all of our energy to destroy other people who are made in the image of God. Brothers and sisters, what David shows us, if anyone in the entire world at any point in history had the right to take up arms against somebody else, it was David. He should have, or he could have stirred up the nation to say, we're going to go destroy my son, Absalom, the insurrectionist. If there's anyone who should have created a censorship campaign, it should have been David. But as we've seen in last week's lament, where he cries out to God on, on behalf of the enemies that are Uh, coming against him. And what we see in this psalm here, we see that his time in the wilderness did not cause him to seek vengeance against his enemies. His time in the wilderness caused him to tap into the ache within his soul and point it back towards God to say, God, we need you more than we need anything else. But simply because God satisfies the thirsty soul even through the wilderness, even through the difficult times and where, the, where we are isolated, it does not mean that God does not care about our enemies. It doesn't mean that God does not care about those who try to defame God's name. It just means that we seek our satisfaction in God and not taking God's job upon ourselves because God himself is entirely sufficient for his job. And we see this next as David closes out this psalm. God not only satisfies the thirsty soul, but God also protects the thirsty soul for those who, who, who long for him and cry out to him. Look at verse 9. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. Those who want to kill me, David says, the the anointed king of Israel, they're not fighting against me, they're fighting against God. They're going to go down to the depths. They're going to receive the judgment that they're due. Those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. Verse 10, they shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. Then David points into not only the fact that God is protecting him from his enemies, but he also leans into his identity, who God has anointed him to be for Israel. And it's almost as if he, in one sentence, has a... Has a personalized reflection on Psalm 2, if you want to turn back there with me. The psalmist says this in Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? When you hear of chaos and turmoil and upheaval and social unrest and the chaos that is within the world, and you go to Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? Why do the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together? So this is a picture of the, the nations surrounding Israel all joining together to, uh, con- to try to overthrow Israel. Why do they do this? Why do they plot in vain against the Lord and against his anointed? And this means the anointed king of Israel saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords. Notice how God responds to the chaos of the world, to the raging of the nations, to the frenzy of media activity that spreads throughout the world to try to stir people up. 
Notice how God responds to that, to try to overthrow the kingdom of God and suppress God's rule and God's reign. Look at what, how God responds in verse 4. And he, this is still him to this day. He who sits in heaven, he who sits in the heavens, laughs. Oh, that's cute. Look at Fox News down there. Look at MSNBC down there trying to plot up and, and rage and stir up a crowd to overthrow the other people. Oh, they're so cute. They're so cute. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion my holy hill. What God establishes, no man can overthrow. And this is why David can say in verse 11 of Psalm 63, the king. He's talking about the true king. The one who is anointed by God to sit on the throne over Israel, to legislate and rule over God's people in God's kingdom, the king shall rejoice in God. At all times and in all circumstances, the king, the true king, shall rejoice in God. And all who swear by him, by God and God's anointed, shall exalt, shall praise God, shall worship God, because they know the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. You want to kill me? Fine, kill me. But the mouths of liars, to finish out the psalm, the mouths of liars will be stopped. You want to fight against God and God's anointed? Your lips will be stopped and your end will be your destruction. This psalm isn't just a longing of David when he is in the wilderness. It also points forward to the son of David who was longing in the wilderness and was tempted for 40 days and yet tempted with all of the things that the world could offer to satisfy his soul. And yet he resisted turning the rocks into bread to satisfy his hunger. He resisted... Uh, he resisted bowing down to worship the rulers of the kings of this earth so that he might rule over them. He resisted the power. He resisted manipulating God's word to the degree that it would suit his own sinful pleasures. He resisted to the degree. And we saw the longing of Jesus Christ's soul in the wilderness, aching for God completely fulfilling the longings that David has in chapter 63 of Psalm of the book of Psalms. And then most explicitly, we see the man of sorrows and the man of longing hanging on a cross, being poured out with his entire life unto death. And what was one of his last words that he said? I thirst. He became poured out unto death, spiritually hungry, spiritually thirsty for more of God, so that everyone, man, woman, and child, who would turn to him, the true king of Israel, the true son of David, who would turn to him to satisfy the longings of their heart, to satisfy the cravings of their soul for more of God, would be fully satisfied in the presence of God forever. Brothers and sisters, if we cannot exalt in God for that, we need to check our hearts for where we are feasting. We need to check our hearts to see if we are feasting on table scraps when God gives us the full presence of himself in Jesus Christ and revealed in his scripture and in his church. If some of you are just now noticing, man, there is this aching and longing within my soul that I've tried to fill with everything, with relationships, with money, with careers, 
and nothing seems to be satisfying it. God perhaps has brought you here this morning to share this particular message with you. That Jesus Christ, the true Son of David, has gone to the cross on your behalf to experience all of the spiritual hunger that you experience now. And three days later, he was raised from the dead and his spirit is poured out upon his people to satisfy the longings of all of their hearts. And if you want to have the longings of your soul satisfied, not just in a temporary moment, but for all of eternity, it comes through knowing him. And you can experience him this morning. And come talk to me after the service. But until then, let us sing, let us worship, let us praise our great King Jesus Christ, our great High Priest Jesus Christ, our great merciful, tender leader Jesus Christ. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the satisfaction that we receive in and through Christ. That he went to the cross on our behalf to satisfy the longings of our soul and that we don't need to worry about, if we are going through a, a wilderness time period, we, we don't need to be worried about being cut off from you forever because you have drawn us near through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Help us, O oh God. Help us to long for more of you. Help us, O oh God, to pursue you with a reckless abandon that desires nothing less and is settled for nothing less than your full presence. God, we love you here in this place. We desire more of you here in this congregation. God, we ask that you would meet us as we sing our praises to you and as we give our time and talent and effort to you and to your kingdom. Help us, O oh God. Help us to walk with you closely. Help us to draw near to you even through the times when it feels like you're so far away and to earnestly seek you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.